Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our online event today. Um, I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy to um, be the host today of today's um, two discussions. We have two short panels um, with three speakers each. Our event today called um, Creating a Union of Freedom and Equal Rights for All. Um, my name, as you see, is Vanessa Cottrell, and this event is organized by the European Movement International in partnership with uh, Metro AG. Uh, EMI and Metro AG have a um, well, long-standing collaboration through which we hope at least to bring together civil society, business, but also policymakers to discuss uh, key European issues, the future of Europe, and topics such as democracy, uh, climate, fundamental rights, and today we'll be talking about um, protecting citizens' rights and um, the rights of all citizens, including LGBTIQ um, uh, people. So our event, um, as probably many of you know, coincides um, with also a lot of recent events um, celebrating um, LGBTIQ rights. Um, this month we celebrate Pride Month. Um, we have seen um, demonstrations, protests, but also celebrations over the past weeks, which is um, wonderful to see. Um, at the same time, we also have some developments that may be more worrying, um, which some of you might also be aware, aware of. Um, be perhaps before I start, I might also clarify that, um, well, I mean, I think our speakers will know, perhaps also most of you watching will know, when I refer to the term LGBTIQ+, I refer to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and queer persons, and people that feel included by this term. So um, we want to use this term as an inclusive collective term. And if we discuss discrimination today, we will mostly, I, I believe, be talking about discrimination on the grounds of uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and uh, sex characteristics. Um, before I introduce our first panel of three speakers, I would just like to encourage you all to send us your questions, your comments, your thoughts. We would love to hear from you during the event. We'll gather questions, or I will gather questions um, with my colleagues um, throughout the event, and we'll ask them to the speakers in the middle and probably also at the end. Uh, you can use our social media channels, uh, channels, you can use YouTube, Twitter, Facebook to ask your questions, and um, yeah, enjoy, enjoy the event. So let me first introduce our first panel. Uh, we have um, Sylvain Agios, who is currently working as a cabinet expert for the European Commission for Equality, Helena Dali. Um, I believe he's previously also worked for ILGA Europe and for the Maltese government. Um, then we have um, Dr. Patricia Pogodzinska, uh, who is a project manager in the research and data unit at the EU Fundamental Rights Agency. And then we have Kim van Sparentak, who is a member of the European Parliament from the Netherlands. Uh, she is sitting in the European Parliament with the Greens. Uh, we've also welcomed Kim already to previous events, and I'm happy to see you, all three of you, and um, Kim again. And also to mention that Kim is um, part of the Parliament's LGBTI intergroup, um, a group bringing together MEPs across parties who um, want to advance um, the protection and rights of LGBTI people. Um, so let me maybe kick off the discussion. I would like to address my first question to Patricia. Um, it will be very interesting and useful, I think, for us to first discuss where we currently are in Europe. Um, where do we stand when it comes to um, LGBTI um, equality for LGBTIQ people? Um, are there maybe certain, certain areas where we need to be paying more attention to? Are there also positive developments? We don't only have to discuss, of course, negative developments, but I think it will be good to have a bit of a, a picture first before we start discussing what we can actually do to promote the rights. So, Patricia, if you would like to give us a short, a short intro of what your perspective is. I think you're still on mute. I also make that mistake a lot. <laughs> um, yep. Can you unmute yourself? Because I think otherwise probably... Yes, yep, uh, you can don't. you hear me now? Yes, um, Thank you for inviting me. And of course, uh, please uh, stop me uh, when I will be too long, uh, mm -hmm. because it's, of course, uh, uh, always difficult to, to close um, this complicated situation in a couple of, of, uh, of, of words. Uh, when we talk about the state of protection, uh, of course, the first thing we think is about the legal... Um, the legal framework, and we have uh, Article 10 of the Treaty on the, fun on the Functioning of, of the European Union, Article 19, uh, also that uh, specifies and protects um, uh, that the EU, EU shall combat discrimination based on sex, racial, ethnic origin, religion, belief, disability, age, 
or sexual orientation. But despite these provisions, and already in the text of the article, we see there's uh, some um, characteristics and uh, missing, like gender identity is not expressly um, provided for, uh, the EU legal framework on equality continues to, uh, to be marked by gaps um, in the promotion of equal treatment. Uh, there are gaps in the secondary law, that is the racial employment and gender equality directives. Uh, do not protect all grants in the same time, in the same in the same manner, um, and to the same degree. We also see that from in, in the legal framework, transgender, intersex people, um, there are limited way in which they can rely on the protection against discrimination uh, if they refer to the ground of sex, which is not ideal. Um, so the employment equality directive is the one that against protects against discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation but only in the area of employment and occupation um, and the data that fra has collected uh, show that outside of the field of employment um, the discrimination has not decreased at all uh, this is based on our 2019 um, lgbti survey uh, for uh, Reminder, we have, um, it's a second survey the FRA has done. Uh, the first one was done in 2012, but it did not cover intersex people. Um, and we have, uh, we had about 140,000 respondents, which make it the largest so far uh, ever survey on hate crime and discrimination against, against LGBTI people. And the results show that only in some uh, in certain areas and in some certain countries, uh, but in other, no progress has been achieved in the last uh, couple of years. And that fear, violence, discrimination, there are still a daily reality for, for many LGBTI people in the EU. Um, we also see why we provide uh, averages, those averages mask uh, important differences. We see important differences between countries. Uh, for example, in some, there are over 70% of uh, respondents say that society is more tolerant, while in others, the same amount of people say it is less tolerant. Um, although the survey um, has not covered the uh, issues relating to COVID pandemic, but other our other uh, research um, looked into that, and we have also seen that the situation of LGBTI persons has worsened, in particular as regard access to healthcare, uh, domestic violence, and here in particular young people who would have to be uh, um, locked uh, in lockdowns in in uh, uh, homophobic uh, or transphobic domestic environment and as regards uh, freedom of movement. Um, I may stop here or I may continue mm -hmm. depending on your, um, or go into details of, of, of more concrete findings. Just How a you... quick follow up. Um, so do you, would you generally say there's a trend across Europe? Can you see certain countries? Can you see differences in countries? Um, sort of, is there a bigger gap or is Europe generally as a whole going towards a certain direction? Just to understand. No, there's really, we, can, we see that there are really uh, a, a significant divergence among member states. There are those who have uh, improved uh, radically and uh, Malta is one, I think, the highlight example. Um, and there are those who, uh, who, who, who does much worse than, than they did in 2012. Uh, so that's regarding the trending, so situation betters or worsens. But if we look at the final numbers, uh, as I said, we can go to 70% people who are very happy about developments and um, both legal developments and also social attitudes. And we have countries where 70 or even more percent is uh, feels uh, fears to go out uh, on the street. Not mm -hmm. only, uh, not not even to mention hold hands, but uh, but just go to, to to a restaurant or to a public event. Okay, thank you. I would like to move on to Sylvan um, to bring in a perspective from the Commission. Um, it's an interesting time also because we we've got now a, our first Commissioner for Equality, and it's also last year I believe um, the Commission launched its first ever LGBTIQ equality strategy. That doesn't mean, I guess, that there's been nothing done before. It just means that we now have a more comprehensive framework. I'm sure Sylvan will maybe um, be able to point out a few things that are new in this approach um, in comparison to previous years. And um, which priorities does this strategy cover? Maybe also touching upon the areas that Patrizia also mentioned already, if it, for example, includes freedom of movement, 
family? Which which parts um, is the commission focusing on on LGBTI equality? So on, I think you can go. Yeah, perfect. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Um, indeed, the commission did not start working on LGBTIQ equality uh, only last year with the strategy. Uh, this was on the agenda before. What changed with the strategy uh, is that for the previous five years, we had a list of actions which was limited therefore in scope. Um, that was already much better than what we had before because we didn't have uh, anything like it. So uh, all action related to LGBTIQ equality was ad hoc until then. And therefore, um, you know, things were moving at a particular rate, at least institutionally. Uh, there was already legislation related to, for example, equality in employment. And there is a proposal that has been proposed uh, 13 years ago now, around equality beyond the area of employment, which has not yet been adopted because it's still in council, being debated in council. But it was more ad hoc, that's what I'm saying. Now we have a strategy where we have ele elevated the area of LGBTIQ equality to the same level as other grounds, like for example, gender equality or disability equality. Uh, that is very important for us. And one major uh, change that you will see in the strategies that have been adopted last year uh, is that they all interlink. We often speak about the union of equality and we don't speak about particular grounds as though they're totally separate from each other. So gender equality has a component of LGBTIQ equality, like LGBTIQ equality has a component of race equality and we keep going, right? Now, what are the specifics? So we're speaking about safety. Uh, we're speaking about uh, equality. So not only legislation, but equality in practice through policies. We're also speaking about specifics related to the LGBTIQ community, like, for example, the freedom of movement, protection from uh, hatred, um, uh, protection also from the likes of conversion practices or intersex genital mutilations, which we can discuss later, but I'm just giving you a highlight, as well as um, the coordination and uh, same level of strength, both in our internal policy and external policy. So they have been harmonized and that is crucial because like this, we can push for equality uh, in, in a stronger way also externally. It's pointless having very strong external policy uh, goals if the internal policy is not matching, because then, of course, your interlocutors, the first thing they will do is say, but why are you calling for this uh, from us if you don't respect it internally, right? So uh, it's very important that both move at the same uh, speed um, and uh, for them to be coordinated and that is uh, crucial in, in terms of the actual proposals so we're currently developing a proposal so that uh, the article in the treaty responsible for you uh, what constitutes a euro crime will be extended that can therefore include uh, hate cr hate crime and hate speech also on the grounds that um, affect lgbtiq people um, we're also looking at uh, freedom of movement, uh, but also mutual recognition. Uh, you will remember the president saying last year, if you're a parent in one country, you're an apparent in all countries. And by that, she therefore meant that the status should be uh, transferable when you move from one country to the next in the EU, regardless of national law on the matter. So there are a number of initiatives like that of a legal nature. Then uh, in compa uh, is a complementary set of measures. We have a number of policy measures to uh, assisting member states develop their national uh, LGBTIQ policy strategies, um, supporting various initiatives at the national level uh, and other measures like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like to know if um, or to what extent uh, civil society also has played a role, just as a sort of short follow-up question, has civil society played a big role in shaping the strategy? Is there um, a constant exchange with civil society? And also, do you take, um, I mean, imagine, I mean, as we spoke already about the differences between some member states, there might also be countries, I imagine, going further than the commission strategy. 
Um, do you see a sort of a slight difference or are you generally sort of, do you, you know, do you take inspiration also from national um, strategies when it comes to um, yeah, adapting the European Commission strategy on this? So a little side note on that one, uh, Patricia uh, mentioned uh, Malta as an example, as a country that stood out during the period between 2012 and the last survey. Um, I am happy to say that I worked for the Maltese government during that period and the major transformation that happened in Malta didn't happen only because the government wanted to do the right thing, but it's because Malta worked very closely with civil society. So we know how, how important that is. The civil society actually, just to give you a sense of how big and important this was, Malta set up what is called the LGBTIQ Consultative Council, whereby legislative proposals were actually at first developed by civil society, proposed to government, government would consider them, tweak them uh, in dialogue with civil society and then propose them in parliament. So if you saw measures that were you were wondering um, how on earth did Malta do it this way? I tell you why, because we worked with civil society throughout the whole journey. So with that in mind, you, you can understand that the same person who was minister in Malta and is now the European commissioner uh, adopts the same approach and the attitude to European level civil society. So we're in constant contact with European level civil society, regardless of the topic. And of course, we, we had strong dialogue uh, with civil society in the development of the strategy. Of course, this strategy uh, is also a political document, so I'm not saying that all that is in there is exactly like civil society expected it, or that, you know, there weren't uh, other elements that were brought in in a particular way or, or formulated um, in our own political way, but the dialogue is constant and it's very important for us to retain it like that because without it we would not be able to succeed in the delivery of, of the measures in the strategy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Kim, I'll bring you in at this point. Um, so you've been already a bit patient. So I would like to know from, um, from your perspective and also from the European Parliament's perspective, um, how do you view the Commission's strategy? Do you think that the strategy is fit for dealing with the issues that we need to deal with right now? Are there certain priorities that maybe the parliament has that um, haven't been brought up right now, like so far in this discussion, and that you might like to highlight? And also, if you want to refer, or if any of you would like to refer to any recent developments um, that we are, of course, all aware of, feel free to also bring them in. Kim, yeah. Yes, thank you so much. And also, thank you for the invitation uh, today. Um, yeah, this, I think this discussion really comes at a very critical time for LGBTIQ rights, you know, um, as most people who are watching and us, uh, we all know what is happening. Um, we, we are experiencing a backlash in our rights in, in certain uh, member states. And the most recent example of Orban, you know, pushing law after law through uh, that heavily impacts the lives of LGBTIQ Hungarians, with the latest one being adopted last week that severely restricts um, you know, uh, children's rights and freedom of expression. And um, they even link LGBTIQ ideology, as they like to call it, uh, to pedophilia. Um, and we know this isn't the first attack of, on the LGBTIQ community. And, um, you know, when we're talking about, um, you know, what the European Commission has done, you know, and it's great that we have an LGBTIQ strategy, but what does it mean if um, you know, on the one hand, the European Commission has an LGBTIQ strategy and um, these kind of practices are still continuing. We already saw it happen in Poland. Um, not much has happened. We're now seeing it in Hungary. Um, so we really need to ensure that, you know, um, we in the European Union, uh, you know, a union that is founded on equality, uh, where it is, you know, a fundamental right to express yourself free, freely, to be who you are. Um, I really think that the European Commission has, you know, let the situation worsen for too long. Um, we have more tools uh, to protect fundamental rights, to protect LGBTIQ people. Um, and we have to strongly condemn the worsening situation and really step up and, um, and act. And, you know, um, 
it's a it's a first step that uh, Commissioner Dali announced inquiry into the laws that Hungary passed, but we need action, and not only against Hungary, but also Poland, um, who's rolling back on the LGBTIQ rights. You know, the EU is not just a money machine. We need really to protect um, the values. So, you know, I think what is very important is that we really um, look at all the tools we have and show um, solidarity with the LGBTIQ community in Europe, not only by saying that we have solidarity, by, but by actually acting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If we can talk a bit more about the tools that we already have um, at the European level. Um, I mean, you mentioned money, uh, withdrawing funding has been used in the past uh, through various programs. Um, that's one possibility. I would like to know from, from I mean, Sylvan and Kim, but also Patrizia, if you have any perspective or view on this, on um, what tools that you should be using more. It can also be linked to, for example, um, I mean, if it's, you know, directed at certain member states, you mentioned Hungary, um, Poland, I think is another country. Um, how effective are these tools? Can we use other tools? For example, also the European Parliament, when it, when it adopts resolutions, um, it can also be awareness raising tools. Are there any specific ones that we should be using more or, or less that you maybe think are not working? In that sense, I guess you, you, you would like to follow up. You want or, me? Yeah, do you yeah. Want and me then to ask maybe you can. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So um, we have many tools, and of course, when we're talking about uh, the rule of law in general and the issues that we're seeing in Hungary, um, you know, the European Parliament has called for um, an Article Seven procedure, and I think um, this is one of the things that um, we should really try to look into again um, because it's been stuck in the Council for a long time. And, you know, this can really sanction Hungary and Poland for, you know, the general um, a breach of EU law and fundamental rights. And it's high time that we move on with this procedure. Um, and it's a very important tool also to protect LGBTIQ people in these countries from laws that discriminate. And secondly, I think the Commission really needs to urgently start infringement <coughs> procedures against Poland and Hungary for not complying with EU law. And lastly, uh, I mean, we have... Um, the uh, we have the agreement that European funding should be conditional based on rule of law. And um, so far, the Commission hasn't enforced this. Um, so I think it's very, very important that we, you know, really show that when we say um, that we want the rule of law to be respected in Europe, that it's actually happening and that we protect everyone to be and uh, everyone can be who they want to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know, Sylvan, if you would like to come on this point on the conditionality mechanism generally on other tools that we can use. Um, I, I can, but I, I, I'm afraid I'll have to be um, to, to make clear one thing. I think one one um, thing that is often mistaken is that this expectation that the European Commission should ex should um, react now. Uh, immediately, just to be clear on on how how we can we can function. Firstly, when there is a draft law, uh, it's general practice that the commissioner, the commission, not commissioner, the commission does not comment on on such such a draft. So we only start to scrutinize something if it is actually law in the country in question. So to apply that to what just happened. Um, recently in Hungary, for example, um, we only started doing any work relate, related to that once it was adopted. Clearly, therefore, uh, we could not have the response because the different services in the Commission uh, had to look at it from their particular perspective. What the Commissioner did, however, is in that her request for the assessment, she made it time-bound and time-limited and the period for the assessment is not particularly long, so that we will have in hand uh, a document that will guide us on whether uh, this actually breaches EU law or not. Now, what does breach EU law? That is also something that is not understood by everybody very quickly. Um, EU law in the area is unfortunately not too well developed. We have treaty provisions, that's true, but in actual hard law, we have legislation regarding the area of employment, um, and then we have legislation, for example, related to freedom of movement and audiovisual services. 
but not with regards to access to goods and services and other things like that. So to be clear, work is ongoing with regards to Poland uh, to assess the a, a possible breach between uh, the what is called the LGBT ideology free zones and the EU treaties and the Aki. So far, we don't have clarity. I'm not saying there is no breach, but we don't have for sure proof in hand that uh, shows this breach. And because of that, uh, the actions that have been taken so far have been limited. Uh, case in point, the funding, uh, the, the withholding of funding to, to uh, certain regions that could not guarantee that they were going to use the funding in a non-discriminatory manner, right? Um, now, in this case of Hungary, the situation is different because the law is different that, and, and also the scope is different. Um, so the assessment with regard to Hungary uh, will take, of course, a different pathway. Is there a direct breach of EU law? Is it indirect? What does it really mean? Uh, can we act based on uh, our own assessment or do we need to have a case of discrimination uh, as may be the case with regard to Poland? So situations vary. Uh, one thing is for certain uh, that the institution uh, throughout its whole hierarchy, all the way to the very top, is not tolerant of discrimination and we want to address it directly and as promptly as possible uh, without, without uh, allowing uh, further negative um, legislation to be adopted or, or negative policies either. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a few more minutes. I see also that Patricia would like to come in. Um, just to remind our audience that if they want to ask any questions, um, please send them to us and um, I'll forward them to our speakers. Um, Patricia, if you would like to come on on this, otherwise I also have another question for you, but go ahead first. Um, to say. So maybe I'll start with your question because maybe it's related and then I will adjust my... <laughs> my question was trying to sort of um, bring in more of a, a long term and bigger picture in terms of also data, because I, I think we we need good data also to be making good policies, right? Um, yes. My yes. question was related to that. Do we have good data on all countries? And since we were talking about employment also um, yes. in that area, mm -hmm. for example. But, um, so, um, yes, so uh, as, as I mentioned, um, uh, we have employment directive and uh, despite um, uh, despite that, uh, we still see little progress has been achieved on the ground uh, since the Commission published its uh, previous report on the application of the directive in 2014, and and we still have uh, see prevalence of discrimination in employment. If regards uh, LGBTI and our data, we see that LGBT who felt discriminated against when looking for work uh, amount to 11%, uh, so about the same uh, share as in 2012 when it was 13%. And, and the same is true for the proportion of LGBTI who felt discriminated against at work, 21% in 2019 versus 19 in 2012. So we might even see it's, it's a very slight um, difference to see whether it's in, increased, but at least it did not change and did not improve. Um, and people who identify as trans uh, are, are included in those features. Um, also, our fundamental rights survey showed that five year in the five-year prevalence of discrimination in employment, uh, twice as high uh, was for those who are identified as a lesbian, gay, or, or bisexual, or other. Um, as regards the discrimination up outside the employment, um, it's still about over 40% of LGBTI persons who feel discriminated. And uh, even in this, um, as, as regards the experiences, um, hate speech, hate crime, of course, is widespread. Uh, harassment, uh, which is, uh, we have two in five persons who have uh, who were harassed in the in the year before this, our survey. We have one in five trans that uh, intersex were physically or sexually attacked, and there are laws. These are laws that are covered by by uh, by, by general criminal and uh, offense law. Um, we still have six in ten persons who have who avoid holding hands in public. Um, and especially our data show a very worrying situation in school. One in two uh, LGBT students, whether it's only or enough, uh, say that someone among their peers 
uh, or, or teacher supported LGBTI, but we have a lot of uh, those who are harassed, bullied, and uh, who have not heard any positive uh, mention uh, at school with regard to LGBTI. And this is also in relation to uh, to Hungarian law, where it will not even be now allowed to to mention. And what has uh, what has uh, actually it's very clear is when there are new laws who promote uh, rights and alongside with support from public figures, whether they are um, politicians or celebrities, uh, that help improve also the social attitudes and, and help people feel safer and allow them to be more open. And of course, uh, negative public dis discourse uh, goes along with, with uh, legal backslide and also um, what we see the law enforcement uh, uh, is lacking against anti-LGBTI acts. So we have laws that are not uh, correctly enforced. We definitely see a need for training um, of enforcement officers uh, because also one of the major issues is that even if there are laws that protect people, LGBTI persons are afraid to report uh, incidents, whether they are like slight incidents or whether they are really serious uh, physical attacks. And the reasons for that is usually lack of trust in, in, uh, towards authorities or even fear of further persecution by, by, by the police, for example. So this, um, this is something that has to be um, addressed. And of course, you mentioned data. Uh, that's a crucial thing in order to know, um, to, to have the exact uh, and the really whole picture um, uh, this collection of data is 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 crucial uh, and we know that very often certain um, certain uh, incidents are not even uh, classified and uh, and statistically do not appear as incidents that are biased uh, on the ground of sexual orientation or gender identity mm -hmm. uh, and the last point also where uh, where we see a gap it's not that people are discriminated always on only one ground. And also with regard to, to LGBTI, that's also um, a, a mixture of, of different grounds. And also here we have a gap uh, in uh, the EU legislation. Uh, so far, according to, to, to judgment of Court of Justice, um, EU law does not allow to, um, to take several grounds working uh, at the same time and uh, uh, address intersexual, uh, intersectional um, discrimination. And this is something also that if ever adopted, the new horizontal directive could address. Thanks. Um, thanks also for bringing up the point on intersectionality and the horizontal approach. I see also um, Kim is nodding. I think um, that would be crucial to have. I don't know, Kim, um, I was actually interested to also hear from you as sort of well, you would be from from all of us the one that would um, be campaigning most for these rights you would be quite visible and i think there's also the more visible you are campaigning for lgbtiq rights the, the higher the risk is for attacks i imagine um do you see a way also for political campaigning how to turn this sort of into a positive narrative how you can focus on i mean apart from of course the celebrations that we were able to see in the past few weeks um long term and how you can kind of create a more of a sense of empowerment and solidarity um, at the same time, of course, focusing on worrying developments and, and raising awareness. Is it a, a tricky for you or do you, do you see a way of dealing with this? Well, actually, um, how I see it is that, you know, as a member of the European Parliament, I represent everyone in Europe. And um, that means that I also represent the people in Poland and the people in Hungary. Um, and, you know, being an LGBTIQ uh, member of the LGBTIQ uh, plus family myself, um, being a strong advocate for the rights of, uh, of LGBTIQ plus people, um, I think is very important in that respect. Um, you know, having a representative that you can look to um, and knowing that they will, um, you know, step up for your rights um, whilst, you know, on, on a lower level, on a national level, um, this doesn't happen. Actually, your rights are being jeopardized. Um, I think is something um, very important and I don't don't take this part of my role lightly. Um, then I think uh, next to that, we have to continue, you know, showing solidarity um, with uh, the community and the organizations um, in countries where, where the situation is being jeopardized um, and where the rights, you know, are just taken away. And I think just continuing, 
you know, to show this solidarity and, you know, really, uh, we're, we're always talking about the community. And I think that is what is so strong um, about the LGBTIQ plus community. We are a community and we stand together. And when in one country something, you know, goes wrong or bad, we're there for the others. Um, and also the other way around, you know, when um, somewhere um, equal marriage uh, or another great law that is supportive to the community um, is adopted, then we celebrate together. So um, I think, um, you know, being part of this community within the parliament, um, pushing that and, you know, showing uh, to the world that, um, that they can't uh, put us down is, uh, is a very important role. Thanks. Um, that was a good finish or um, halftime finish before I move on to my um, to our other three, three um, panelists. Um, so I will do a switch. We'll see three new um, speakers. You will stay and you will be able to also come at the end. Um, so if you have any questions or further comments that might pop up over the next half hour, also listening to our other speakers when we talk about what civil society and what business can do, um, don't hesitate to bring them up and we'll we'll bring them up at the end. So thank you already um, for your comments so far and I'll see you in a bit. <laughs> thank you. So I will be joined um, by three new speakers that have been already listening in and that are ready to share their views and experiences. First up, we have Nikita Baranov, who is an executive assistant to the chief human, right, human resources officer and LGBT plus activist for Metro AG. Uh, we have Belinda Dia, who is advocacy officer at ILGA Europe. And last but not least, uh, Annette Pampo, who is senior human resource consultant on diversity issues at Coca-Cola um, in Germany. Um, welcome to the three of you. Uh, thanks for joining me and um, I hope you've enjoyed the discussion so far and um, we're going to be discussing maybe a slightly different perspective. Um, we, you know, as civil society and business, there are certain tools that we can use to address the issues and um, that we've just discussed um, with our um, other speakers. So I would first maybe like to um, hear from Belinda. Um, well, as we just were talking about, there's a lot of things happening at the moment, both positive but also very worrying developments. So it seems like a very busy time for civil society um, defending these rights. Um, how do you see this? Are there certain? Um, are you kind of? Uh, would you would you agree with what has been said so far? Where we need to, you know, um, uh, direct our eyes and our attention to um, the pandemic? I guess has probably affected your work and your network's work. Um, maybe you'd like to sort of highlight a few priorities and then I'll move on to Anna and Nikita. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, so, yeah, it was interesting hearing the the previous panel, of course, because it's a very EU focused work. And it's been really great um, to see the positive steps that EU has been taking to ensure um, equality for LGBTI people um, across the EU and the renewed commitment that we've been seeing from the Parliament uh, when they declared themselves an LGBTIQ freedom zone. Um, from the commission with the with the strategy has been really important and also a really important signal to LGBTIQ people across Europe. Um, however, obviously, uh, as Elga Europe, we're we're always in contact with our members on the ground, so we keep seeing the 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 daily reality. And there's a lot that still needs to be done uh, to to make. Uh, the EU and LGBTIQ freedom zone truly and we need um, concrete action from the European level but also um, and this perhaps links a bit more with what Sylvan was saying it's really important to see it uh, at every kind of strata of society so and, and government so the national level uh, the local and regional level and of course this is um, where business comes to, to play in as well um, so every year actually ILG Europe we publish uh, an annual review of the situation for LGBTIQ people in the countries that we work with. Uh, so that's across Europe and Central Asia. Um, and it's not just, um, in, in, in terms of the situation in the, in the EU, it's not just the countries which always get the, the negative press, such as Hungary and Poland, but also many other EU countries um, where there needs to be a lot more work. Um, many are regressing on LGBTI rights um, and unfortunately even more are stalling. So we've been seeing over the past few years this kind of trend of um, governments across the EU kind of um, almost complacency. Uh, so, so not really acting and not necessarily um, stepping up and being loud in favor of LGBTI rights, even though they are supportive. Uh, but of course, in the worst case scenarios and not just in Hungary and Poland, we're seeing outright attacks, rollbacks on rights and, and smear campaigns. 
Um, and I'll just give some examples of gaps in legislation at the moment. Um, Actually, only Malta, Portugal, Germany, and some regions in Spain have banned non-medically necessary surgeries on intersex children. Uh, the Czech Republic, Finland, Latvia, Romania, and Slovakia still require trans people to be sterilized before having access to legal gender recognition, uh, while Hungary actually abolished the procedure uh, um, completely uh, last year. Um, there's still judgments uh, that are not being implemented. For example, the Court of Justice EU judgment of uh, 2018 in the Komen case, uh, which established that same-sex spouses are fully recognized as spouses under the EU Freedom of Movement Directive, has still not been enacted by the Romanian state. And the partner uh, of Adrian Komen still hasn't been granted a residence permit in Romania, uh, which leaves same-sex couples in sim similar situations in limbo. Um, there are also quite a lot of member states which still don't have legislation to protect LGBTI people uh, against discrimination outside of the labor market. And as Patricia mentioned also in the previous panel, that, that really shows because there's discrimination that really hasn't improved uh, outside the labor market. And uh, as Kim mentioned, we're seeing this backlash across the continent. So yes, now is the time that we need our allies to speak up and act strongly. Governments need to lead by example. Um, and for example, when it comes to legal gender recognition, we're seeing a big wave of transphobia across uh, Europe um, and governments are even abandoning legislation and stalling on it. Uh, so we need to see, you know, often these these countries, the countries which would uh, speak out uh, about LGBTI rights violations abroad, but we need to see what are you doing at home as well. Um, and governments need to be held accountable to the principles set out in the EU treaties and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. There needs to be full implementation of all relevant EU directives and CJEU judgments in every member state. And all of the member states should be spending EU funding in full respect of the principle of non-discrimination and fundamental rights. Um, so we would like to see more clear calls from the council level um, to, to ask the European Commission to act, which it is trying to do, but that signal from the council level is really important. Um, and to call on the proper implementation of, of judgments. Thank you. Um, that was very comprehensive. Also interesting to hear how um, some countries that we may not pay attention to or that may themselves think that they're doing enough for LGBTIQ rights may actually have become complacent. Um, Nikita and Anetta, um, bringing in the business perspective, but also your personal perspective, if you like, I think we've had a very interesting example today of how um, the, the sort of protection of LGBTI rights and um, I mean, I'm referring to the example of um, the Euro Cup and the, the, the whole debate about displaying the flag on um, the stadium in, in Munich, how other organizations, um, how um, businesses can kind of be part of this, this fight, this struggle. Um, and maybe let's start with how we can promote rights and equal rights within organizations, within businesses. And maybe then afterwards we can discuss how, what kind of leverage businesses will have also to promote um, certain values in Europe outside of their business. So maybe perhaps first, Aneta, how can businesses um, promote diversity, equality within their own business and how can they make employees feel safe, first of all? Um, would you like to already say a few sure. words on that? Thanks for having me. Um, I do think the first step for uh, companies is to, um, or for people of the LGBT community is to, to feel safe when you are visible within your company. So it starts with, um, do you have uh, network groups? Do you have um, people who are eager to be a little activist uh, in your company? But otherwise the company itself um, should set up a culture where people uh, feel safe. It starts with, um, with of course, signs like flag risings um, that all the workforce uh, really recognizes the visibility of LGBT within uh, a company. I do think that we do at Coca-Cola um, a lot of things um, in the last couple of years to um, set up safe spaces for colleagues. Uh, may it be just um, not only LGBT community members, but also to um, to counsel trans persons uh, during their uh, transition. Um, 
to educate people as allies or to educate people to um, to understand what trans means. If you if you work together, it's important that the people are kind of um, um, talk to each other and and figure out what what trans means. And otherwise, uh, we try to um, to do it as smooth as possible for trans persons in our company. This is one uh, one thing I think. The other thing is that allyship means that in this year um, at the Ida Hobbit Day, we uh, had 20 flag raises at several sites in Germany. So this was all organized most of the time from uh, by, by people who are allies, who are not belonging to the LGBT community themselves. So I do think it's important to have this together, the community uh, people engaging within the company. And the, I think it's of course important to set up a culture where people can come out in the company. And this is a journey. And we started that years ago when we founded the network in Germany, the LGBT network in 2014, but we went a long way. And today it seems like it's far away, but it was a start then. And I do think this is what companies can do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Nikita, uh, I imagine, um, I mean, there has been, you know, already some activities in Metro regarding the visibility, um, supporting those who want to come out. Um, are there any other, or these, some of the main things that the Metro is working on at the moment? Are there certain examples that you could give of actions or diversity policies that you've seen have worked? Maybe also some that haven't worked or that you've tried, um, that have been tried in Metro that you know might not be um, as effective as, as thought. Sure, sure. Thanks for having me. And I fully subscribe to what Annette has said that uh, awareness and visibility is key, what, what companies can provide. And you cannot educate people less really you need to find a way out how you can scale awareness training to happen at every hierarchy in the company and this session has to had to be mandatory from my point of view i'm just coming out of an uh, of an awareness training with some of our international regional managers today and i heard one comment from our regional managers that he said in the end, I should assume somebody from my uh, team could be LGBTIQ+. And this is something he hasn't considered prior to this kind of a training. And this I would call uh, a nice step, a baby step. And this, this these trainings have to happen uh, really on a regular basis, uh, not only during Pride Month or, or the Ida Hobbits or whatsoever, but should be able to be accessed uh, throughout um, the whole year. Secondly, uh, Annette also referred to it, a good bunch of allies is really crucial. So, I mean, we in Metro had also a time we had far more allies in the network uh, than LGBTIQ plus people, which is fully fine because our network was uh, from the beginning an inclusive one but um, our straight allies are those multiplicators who can bring this inclusive thought into their teams and and uh, s spread the word and um, what we have done also in the recent years that uh, right we, we secured it right from the beginning, our potential candidates uh, who, will, who will work for Metro get in touch with us as an employer uh, and uh, see that there are uh, networks, there is an LGBT plus network. And uh, we also manage it that uh, we are part of all the onboardings happening in our company that right from the beginning, the employees see there's a network where I can really engage with and uh, there's a push for, for progress and Metro Pride is part of it. And uh, I think this these are little tweaks uh, which which helps um, in the end to, to create this open, uh, uh, open workplace. You asked me also what policy um, was not working or, or kind of thing. So where we, uh, I think, uh, struggled a bit is a, all the question of uh, 
gender neutral restrooms. I think this is a very, very sensitive uh, topic uh, still uh, in our company where we tried something, uh, get some good and bad comments for sure, but we still have this on our radar to uh, become more and more inclusive going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and do you find it, this, direct, uh, this question is directed to both you, Nikita and Annette, do you find it um, difficult to sort of encourage dialogues within the organization? Because as you say, it's sometimes a sensitive topic. You're not sure if people want to talk about it. Um, on the one hand, awareness is good, but then you have people working in the organization not really fully aware of um, some of these issues. So do you manage to create more of a dialogue or have you, have you been able to do so over the past years? Would you like to create more of a dialogue? And do you see any kind of, would you see sort of the next steps going to even further um, enhance the kind of exchange and, and strengthen the, the dialogue? So if I may add uh, to this, I would say that uh, every of this change can only happen in a dialogue way. So uh, we have to uh, enhance the dialogue and we have to make, to see how we can scale uh, this dialogue up also um, beyond our borders uh, in Germany, but also get in touch with all the uh, all the international uh, parts of Metro where we still are and uh, happily have installed an international DNY champ community in all our 34 countries, where people are locally responsible for uh, all the diversity topics and driving some, uh, some, some particular projects with us globally and uh, are the go-to persons for any um, of, uh, of employees or managers who have uh, questions in this regard. And I think this community building within the company is uh, a crucial thing going forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nikita. Annette, I don't know if you wanted to add anything from your perspective to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what we take to, uh, what we should take into consideration is um, we also work globally or um, at the moment in, on a European way, and as you know, we are now European uh, Europe Pacific, so we add some countries uh, from the Pacific side. But anyway, um, if you start to to get con uh, to get connected between the countries, um, you figure that you have very different conditions. Um, in the countries. And we started with a um, so-called listening sessions uh, on a European level, where we asked uh, on the different dimensions of culture, um, of um, culture, um, how do you feel? What are the um, issues you have? What are the challenges you face? Um, and within uh, the LGBT group, the, it was clear that we do start from very, very uh, different starting points. And um, therefore, uh, after finishing those listening sessions, we started to have uh, catalyst or set up catalyst groups on each dimension. And of course, I do work in the LGBT uh, plus catalyst group. And we just check, uh, checked out how the basis of our countries is in uh, so far that we started a, an audit just to figure where should we go forward and what is, are we supposed to do in the countries, starting with visibility, as we mentioned uh, before. And we just uh, finished the audit um, two months ago, and we are now in the status of uh, checking out what will be the next steps. And this year, of course, we started that we painted um, rainbow walks in every country on one side, or that we uh, raised flags, or that we um, do have our internal media channels to, to uh, po make posts on pride to get people involved. And it's so interesting to see what happens there, uh, how the community as well as the allies are working on it. And of course, in the long run, you have to talk about policies and uh, you have to par anti-discrimination uh, policies. You have to, to do something uh, concerning anti-harassment 
Um, in different countries, you also have to talk about healthcare um, access and so on. So what we do now is we are right at the place that we figure and just try to implement um, things to get forward. And I think this is something that companies can do and where we have the power, even that um, I, I usually say that we in the company, um, we have a cross section of the population. So we have people who support LGBT and we do have people who deny the, the entire LGBT movement. But to gather people and say, what is our value? What is our company standing for? This is uh, very, very important, I think. And it has, a company has to take a stand and the responsibility for the people to, who work in the company and that our uh, workforce is at least accepting our values. Mm -hmm. Thank, thanks, Annette. Um, Belinda, maybe from your perspective, from a civil society perspective, do you find that the role of business um, in, this, um, in this fight, in this fighting for LGBTIQ rights and equality, has it changed? Has it shifted? Has, um, have businesses maybe taken over more of a... Um, I would almost like to say an activist role. Um, I mean, not only internally making sure that there are diversity policies in place, but also externally supporting um, activists and civil society on the ground. Do you find that something's changed, and and how do you see this? Maybe even symbiosis. Um, I don't know how you would how you describe it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's um it's very interesting, especially in the context of um, this kind of backlash that we're seeing um, in the European context. Um, yeah, we've been seeing more engagement from from businesses. Businesses are reaching out more often to uh, ILGA Europe, but also our, our member organizations to see how how they can support. Um, and of course, as as has been mentioned, business has a, a lot of very important um, roles, especially for for their own employees, uh, but also they can help um, activists in in the country. Um, what we what we would always say though is that, that we should always follow the principles of working with the community. So whatever country you're in, um, getting in touch with them or or with us so that we can link you with them um, is very it's very important. So that um, any actions that are taken by business in a kind of advocacy field or campaigning field um, are kind of aligned with with civil society, so that they don't accidentally end up putting LGBTI rights defenders at risk, especially in countries where they are um, on a daily basis at risk. Um, and also, it's important to lead by example. Um, so, for example, if a business has like a main branch in uh, the UK, that the principles used there are also used in a branch in a country where it is more hostile towards LGBTI people. Um, and speaking out loud and clear against discrimination, um, hate, hate speech, and so on is is really is really important, and we're we're seeing that more often. Um, and then, of course, um, activists have been asking that that businesses stay in the country. So when it gets more difficult, especially if we think about, for example, Hungary and what's happening now, uh, and how it's going to affect advertising uh, or um, the media. Um, it's really it's really important that the businesses kind of stay by their their um, standards and and still uh, stand up for the LGBTI community, even if that means that they might receive fines. Um, it's actually also quite useful to litigate against those fines. So take them on and then litigate them, um, just to kind of keep keep that support for the LGBTI community and also to show how uh, how this kind of legislation actually goes against international human rights law. Um, so yeah, and and I would mm -hmm. say uh, another another aspect that's interesting kind of links to COVID nineteen because I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, COVID nineteen has of course impacted LGBTI people very very hard, especially the most vulnerable. Um, and the commission also identified that that the the most uh, the members of the LGBTI community who have uh, the most difficulty in accessing employment without discrimination are trans and intersex people, um, but also broader LGBTI community as well experiences still discrimination in accessing employment. So it's very interesting for businesses to look at, you know, that equality for the people who are employed, but it would also be interesting to see how 
um, businesses can also help um, with uh, those EU kind of commitments to looking at, um, you know, the best practices for for trans and intersex people and other LGBTI people to 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 access the labour market. Best exchange um, about you know how to how to ensure that higher participation. Perhaps look at the number of LGBTI people in you know collect data on LGBTI people in the organisation and then see where the gaps are because it's not. It's not that um, people aren't people aren't applying in the sense of they don't want to, but it's because LGBTI people experience discrimination throughout their lives in education, uh, in of course employment, housing, and the healthcare sector, which means that they often can't uh, reach um, the situation where they might apply for that job. So there's uh, quite quite a bit of work to do at looking at that and kind of tackling that uh, inaccessibility to the uh, labour market that LGBTI people experience. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Belinda. Uh, I'll just use this opportunity to remind that we still have 15 minutes, so we can still discuss a few more things. And also in a bit, we'll bring in the other three speakers. Also to our audience, we are collecting questions, but you can still send us questions. And um, if there are any already for the panel now, I will ask them. And otherwise, I'll save the others for our other speakers. Um, good thing also, Belinda, that you mentioned data again. I think um, it's clear that this is really a, a, an important sort of a tool also to know where um, we have to sort of direct our policies and how to develop policies, whether it's EU level or within businesses. Mm, there's one point that came up in our previous panel when it was about um, inclusiveness, inclusiveness of um, the LGBTIQ community and taking into account, um, well, intersecting discriminations and, and identities and forms of discrimination. Um, is this something that you're aware of? Um, now I'm directing that question at Nikita and Anessa within um, your organizations uh, that there are you know, issues or the way you have to deal also with um, people within the community that might have, I don't know, might be um, queer migrants or, or there's all sorts of um, different forms, I guess, of discrimination and identities. Um, do you, are you able to address these or is this also another challenge that you are dealing with currently? And yeah, I think, like yeah, Nikita, go yeah so, so um, we are looking also more and more closer to intersectionality because uh, you come to this uh, party not only uh, with, with one dimension, um, I would say, and uh, we are trying to, to find and to address also some of the patterns, uh, um, patterns we see and uh, try to uh, also always also in the trainings um, um, to to get this out it is a, always a combination of different dimensions which uh, is um, yeah also causing um, some some microaggressions some 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 discrimination uh, points and uh, we, we we see this uh, also often with um, with women uh, who are people of color for instance um, we see that a lot with uh, with uh, migrants who are part of the lgbtiq community so those patterns are quite obvious and we need to find paths and ways how we address it uh, thank you, Nikita. I don't know, Annette, if you want to add something to that. Well, I do think it's necessary to have an IND strategy uh, within your company and to um, be aware of intersectionality, of course. And you can't just focus on one pillar of the dimension and say, oh, we just do LGBT plus. And of course, in a traditionally um, male dominant uh, branch like uh, beverage industry, the second one is gender, which is usually, as you know, not gender at all. It's always getting becoming women into into um, the company. So this won't work. So our strategy just covers all dimensions, and we try to to even though there are there might be and there definitely are a lot of biases, we try to. Um, gather this into our um, educational programs, into unconscious bias workshops and cultural awareness workshops, um, not to be just focused on one dimension. This won't work. It's so important because there might be people who 
uh, inherit all of these dimensions or just three or four of this. And some people are not aware of it. So um, you have to, to, to educate, especially leadership, um, to be aware of their own biases on, and on what uh, we focus on. So this is, for me, um, the most important thing to really, really um, focus on all dimensions and be aware of intersectionality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, before I bring in um, other speakers um, and to ask a few more questions, also an audience question. Um, I was also wondering, um, from, from a citizen's perspective, I think citizens are also aware of the risks of businesses supporting certain, certain causes. Um, we know of greenwashing and there's also pinkwashing. Um, how do you see this challenge um, and how can we be sure of um, a business commitment that is sustainable and long term and honest? Um, uh, I mean, OK, from your perspective, it's, it's, I guess it, it makes sense. You know, your policies are, are honest. But how do you see the, the risk of um, diversity policies that can be considered as pinkwashing used, for example, for a certain image, but don't really last and then are not there to have an impact? Um, uh, this question is also directed to all three of you. I know Belinda, you might have views on this, but maybe first Nikita or Aneta, if you would like to yeah, you see this so, challenge, if it's something. Yes, I, I, I see this challenge, but I think this challenge comes along with how you um, how you set up the, to uh, the topic of the LGBTIQ plus inclusion in your company. And what we have recently done is we uh, have built an international team out of the DNY champs and wrap up our minds about uh, an international LGBTIQ plus strategy, which is not coming only uh, in Pride Month for the Ida Hobbits, but pointing out like uh, 12 or 13 occasions during the year where you can uh, really set impulses and create uh, more inclusive and uh, communicate inclusively about it, um, which is, uh, well, bringing a lot of, uh, of uh, discussions on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, guides our people how they can really sustainably um, approach this topic within uh, the different metro entities. And um, you see it also in, in, in our uh, strategy over the last years, we have always been there with LGBTIQ inclusion throughout the year and uh, even try to put some of our actions out of the of the usual Pride Month uh, seasons to really uh, not uh, being uh, really uh, holding accountable for doing pink washing in the end. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, thanks, Nikita. Annette, I don't know. I mean, that was pretty clear. It was a, a good answer. And um, I think, indeed, if we see long term commitment, um, it is visible and we can tell it apart. But I don't know if you had any other thoughts on this. The, the kind of yes, sometimes um, I do struggle with this uh, reproach or accusation of pinkwashing because it's easily said and you can uh, mention it, but you have to know, and this is exactly what Nikita said, what does the company do in reality? And we started grassroots uh, by uh, initiating the Rainbow Network. So um, this is when it started and it was just a group of people and nobody told us what to do. It was uh, within the company starting. And then our first goal was to set up visibility, as I mentioned, and we wanted to be seen and valued and respected. And we fought hard, uh, hard to be recognized and to, to be seen. And of course, this had an impact on our culture and our strategy. And now, years later, um, inclusion and diversity is not even a name. We just, of course, when you start a network, the first thing people want is, oh, we want to be part of the parade. And uh, we stopped this idea right at the beginning because we thought we should start within our company first before we go out and before we uh, we present our company somewhere as LGBT friendly before we haven't reached our our um, workforce. So I do think this is a, a thing that uh, you should look at first. And otherwise, I think that companies who just 
go through a learning process, um, we, we should allow them to go out then and to do and to show their their activities concerning, especially um, today, um, concerning LGBT community. We have been working together with um, community organizations for a long time, and this was always happening. Nevertheless, we got the um, accusation of pinkwashing uh, once in a while. Um, I, I don't think um, that I want to uh, justify this because I think I know what we've done and I know how many people are engaged in LGBT uh, activities and uh, rights within our company and we are getting closer. We're really growing together. All the countries have members from every country uh, within Europe uh, belonging to the CCEP just working hard on this. And there might be people who haven't been out a couple of years ago. And they are now working on this because they they just um, experience that we are on a journey. And this makes me really happy because when I look back at the beginning of our network, there was nothing else. We had been the first network in Europe in 2014. And now there is such a bunch of people who are engaged and who are active that it really is making me so happy. And I, I do think if somebody comes and says, oh, that's pinkwashing, I can say, oh, you might see that this way, but it's totally different. And if you're not interested in looking at it, it's your fault, not mine. Good, good answer, <laughs> I like that. Um, so I'm gonna ask our other three speakers to join us. Um, so it will be a big table or a virtual table. Um, I think my colleague will kind of automatically add them and they will reappear magically. Um, so I also have one question, but I see she's not yet on the screen um, for Patricia. So I will hold off with that one. First of all, um, oh, there she is. Um, I'll ask that question in a sec. We have one question from the audience for Patricia. Um, before I ask that, I just wanted to know if, um, so Sylvan, um, Patricia or Kim, if you have any comments on what is being said just now, if you see any sort of um, untapped potentials maybe for cooperation between business, civil society, policymakers. Um, if yes, feel free to come in now. Um, I don't know if Sylvan was at a hand or was it? Yep, do you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. But before I wanted to quickly react to some of the things that were said very quickly. Yep, sure. Firstly, yeah. you, Vanessa, asked the question about countries and whether they are doing enough. And that's a loaded question actually, because what is enough and how much is enough? Um, I think enough is when uh, a country cannot do more and then it stops because it, does, it cannot. When uh, there is some sort of balancing of issues and kind of um, uh, LGBTIQ equality is not fully considered, for me, uh, a country can only claim that it is LGBTIQ equal the moment that to use the Ilga Europe Index a country scores 100 on it. So not a single EU country can celebrate that yet, um, although, of course, there are different countries on, on in different positions on that scale, but not a single country can celebrate that. So uh, not not all, not a single country has done enough, and I think that's the way, that's the starting point, actually. Otherwise, it's a self-congratulatory <coughs> exercise, which I think is, is, um, is not too good. Then uh, I also have a comment regarding what constitutes as a s sensitive topic in a company. I think discrimination should be the sensitive topic and not LGBTIQ realities that are part of nature, have been there, will continue to be there. We exist as people. Um, this is the way we are. So again, um, that I have a comment about because it does have an impact on how things are presented. Do we, um, as companies, uh, function in a particular way in certain markets and then in others we take a step back because that market is sensitive to these issues and so it's, we don't want to rock the boat? I know, of course, companies are not activists, but still there's a question to be had there. And that relates to companies like it relates to the European Commission. Uh, equality is not about appearing to uh, looking good, it's about actually doing the right thing. And that is a very different um, uh, approach. So 
In terms of then of companies uh, and their role in the, in the equality sector, absolutely. Uh, not only companies, but also local government, uh, local institutions, any small organization that may have been skipped because they're not big enough for conversations like the one we're having. Honestly, they too have a lot to contribute because equality can only come about in society the moment that it is embodied. It's 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 the way we function um, all the time. Uh, this this shouldn't be the exception. This should be the rule. And so, ideally, all companies join uh, our own diversity charters. For example, uh, we have. 26 uh, diversity charters in the EU. It's only one member state that does not have it yet. Um, so that's a process that we really encourage a member, uh, uh, you know, companies to be part of. And yes, companies uh, and LGBTIQ equality, like all equality, really, uh, we're discussing LGBTIQ today, but we could have been discussing uh, racial equality or, or gender equality. And I would have the same message to, to companies. Absolutely be part of the process and also pose sometimes the difficult questions because it's only then that we achieve what we need to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, good points. Thank you for raising those. Um, unless there are any comments, immediate comments, I could already squeeze in the question that we have from the audience. Um, this one to Patrizia, if anyone else wants to comment, that's also um, perfectly fine. The question is on the data again. Um, how do we make data from different countries comparable? as there may not be a lot of people in some countries who are able to speak freely. So in terms of collecting data, do we actually have accurate data and how do we get this data if indeed people are not able to speak out? Um, yes, well, this was rather a question to, to our statisticians that to me as a, as a lawyer, um, uh, we uh, take care that the uh, data that we get, get that we receive are, are uh, properly weighted and all the details uh, regarding technicalities of, of the research uh, can be found in our technical report. Um, I may put a link, I don't know, but if um, I think uh, um, that's available on our on our website. But uh, of course, this is um, uh, pay highly quality high high um, attention to the quality of the data uh, we had uh, special uh, measures taken in order to also um, uh, identify any anything that would be suspicious uh, we also uh, according to 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 the to the uh, uh, the statistical um, rules certain a uh, small amount of uh, respondents uh, if are not if they are taken into account or, or not it is marked in the report and and um, in the data that for example this is a very uh, low um, uh, too low respondents to make uh, to, to 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 include it but it is available raw data are also available other than that that are in our report they are available in the data explorer that covers um, all questions and all um, all um, findings from the survey. Also, that that could not be because of the space; they could not uh, be um, covered in our main report. And so, I invite you, as, as regards the technicalities, because um, this is not my field of expertise, and I don't want to be um, uh, too superficial in that. Um, this is prepared by the statisticians and uh, and it's available on um, with all the relevant questions uh, as regarding how the how the data are weighted and how how we deal with that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, it's a good point also for for anyone listening or watching to to also um, check out the documents and um, the reports that were mentioned during the discussion. Also from ILGA, I think it's a very interesting tool to to see. Um, also the work of the Commission, the Parliament um, and businesses. Do you know if any of the other speakers would like to come in on any of the points? Is there something that you would like to get rid of that you haven't been able to say um, in terms of civil society, business roles, responsibilities or any any other points? Um, yes, yeah, Kim and Nikita. Yeah. Do you want to go first, Kim? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you know, that just to come back to the point of pink washing, perhaps, um, because, you know, there's you have pink washing and pink washing. There's different types of pink washing, I would say. So first of all, you have companies that you know um, that use it 
um, as a distraction from from other things. And I think you know what we've seen in the past week with uh, the UEFA and not allowing Munich um, to uh, have a rainbow um, on their um, on their arena in solidarity with Hungary, uh, whilst they have been uh, having a float on uh, on the Amsterdam Pride. I think you know then you then it becomes a very problematic thing. Like you're just showing off on a pride. Um, but in practice, what are you doing um, to support the LGBTIQ community? Uh, and and that is, um, you know, just the, the external part. Um, but internally, I mean, we've heard plenty of stories that, you know, fostering an, uh, a place where you can, you know, where you can come out um, in the football world um, is, is not something that they're doing either. So um, I think this is very problematic pinkwashing. But then, of course, you have the other part, which is pandering to the LGBTIQ community. Um, and there, I think um, we also have to be very careful with looking at, you know, what can a company do? But I think um, one of the things that hasn't been discussed much yet is, you know, the, the, the role that companies can play using their economic leverage. You know, a big corporation, when they uh, say they don't want to collaborate with the government anymore because of, uh, or don't want to be in a certain region anymore because it has been declared L an LGBTQI freedom zone, for example, you know, that is a kind of power that uh, a big corporation can really use. And I think it's it would be very interesting to see if, if these kind of things will happen, um, especially since we're seeing you know, some backlashes. Mm -hmm. uh, I can yeah. meeting myself. Yep, uh, Nikita, if you'd like to. Yeah, and I can, we still have a few yeah, minutes. Briefly, so, yeah. I can really yeah. build on what Kim is saying. And, uh, and I think it's a provocative statement, but I'm fully convinced that only institutions and civil society and business can turn the world we are living in because unfortunately I see more and more politicians who are not putting LGBTIQ topics in focus when talking to other leaders in the world who still oppresses the community. And also Angela Merkel is not talking anymore to Mr. Putin about LGBTIQ plus rights in Russia. They're talking about economy, about Nord Stream pipeline or similar. So it's solely the power of the private sector which can take politics in charge of changing the world for a better place and that's uh, truly what i believe in we saw it back in 2014 uh, in davos on the world economic forum and we'll only see an impact if we finally try to create mutual forces with companies institutions civil society to really showcase the tremendous amount of people behind those movements who press for progress and then will definitely have an impact on these issues um, I have kept you all longer than expected, um, and I'm really grateful also for all these good comments. Um, it's been a very honest discussion, I thought. I don't know if there are any final comments. Um, this will be the very, very last opportunity. Um, yes, and I'm happy to give them. Yes, Patricia. Yes, um, I will maybe add quickly that um, it, it has been already uh, mentioned uh, that uh, also the LGBTI rights is some, some kind of uh, also measure of general condition of rule of law in, in a country. Uh, and uh, of course, we see that in those countries that the problems uh, and that where LGBTI people suffer mostly. Uh, uh, strangely, we also have issues with judiciary. We have issues with freedom of uh, speech. We have freedom uh, problems with, uh, with free media. Um, so that's why um, government, but of course, we're that re regards also uh, civil society and business. Everyone should uh, pay attention, and there should be. A zero tolerance policy uh, uh, awareness raising of course uh, is crucial uh, and education education that you cannot close your eyes on the um, any even slight um, signs of discrimination uh, towards a vulnerable group um, and as regards businesses in part in 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 the context of business um, that is also a Broader, um, a broader topic of general um, equality of arms between a business and an individual, or whatever kind of human rights is violated by uh, by a business or by its activity, and uh, transparency, monitoring, uh, possibility of uh, disclosure of certain documents in order to monitor the company policy, or also in order to. Um, have concrete evidence in terms of litigation because we have seen strategic litigation is a very powerful tool uh, but information uh, and also information provision to consumers uh, is also uh, one of the uh, 
possible and powerful tool because the consumers can have a great impact uh, on on the company policy if there's a um, somehow um, broad information about a certain discriminatory um, practices uh, by a company um, it has there has been examples that uh, the reaction from from consumers um, is very often strong and that is also something that can incite company to change uh, the practice mm -hmm. so um we touched upon a lot of points and maybe to just use the words from silvan just now we're not there yet um, all of the countries can still do their part and i think business and civil society play a role um, institutions policymakers rely on civil society and business i think that's been clear and it's really been good to have this discussion i hope um, this is the first of many more discussions um, involving civil society the institutions and business um I, it would be our pleasure to see you again for these discussions and to continue the debate um at this stage maybe let me also thank the audience for listening in for the questions um if you are interested in the content in the reports that have been mentioned you can find them on the respective websites of the organizations. Also, if you go on the event page of the European Movement International for this, you will find, of course, still the names of the speakers. Uh, thank you all for joining. I wish you all a very nice afternoon and evening and see you soon. Bye.